clothes. Uh, you oh, sorry. <laughs> I I not maybe as you just you're just like a library, just full of you know good information. I love the way you articulate everything. Um, the other question I have is, um, we're very well aware of a lot of the the the, the former tactics that um, I guess American society at large has used to marginalize people of color, black people specifically. Uh, in this case, um, obviously a lot of laws have changed. A lot of like you know it's not. I say it acceptable to be uh, a racist out in the open anymore. Where are some of the, when it comes to Venice, West LA, Santa Monica area, what do you feel are some of the tactics now being used to uh, marginalize uh, black folks and people of color within you know, the Venice, Santa Monica area? Well, one thing I see that, that is happening that's marginalizing in a way in, as far as education is concerned are the immersion schools, you know, where you focus on a specific language like the Chinese immersion schools or the um, um, French immersion schools or what, what, that is exclusive to many um, minorities and particularly uh, African Americans. Uh, there's, there has been um, for many, many years the issue of whether or not education in the inner cities is comparable to education levels in other affluent areas within the state of California. As a matter of fact, LA Unified School District, the second largest school district in the country, is way at the bottom of the page when it comes to educational achievement levels. So education definitely is a way that uh, African American and the children of color are marginalized um, at a very early age, which then um, is supportive and fills the pipeline from from prison from from education to the prisons because if you don't get educated at a elementary school level the chances of you getting adequate education as you move yeah. up that ladder is is next to none and so that's why you have a disproportionate number of african american men in prison my dissertation which is um uh, talking about the, the personal transition of African American men from the world of criminality to desistance. And my question, because I read many, many books to say, what is the tipping point that changes these men that may have gone to prison many times, recidivated many times, to change their life? Because you can't get it from the warden in the prison, you can't get it from the social worker, you can't get it from the cop on the street, you can't get it from the parole or the probation officer, or those theorists that write books about why people commit crimes. The only way I could get it, and I read many books, they did not answer the question until I went directly to an individual and said, and he's public part of my uh, dissertation, Michael Murray. Why did you continue to go to prison after you went the first time? And what was the tipping point that made you not ever go again? Some people in the books said if you came from a single parent, you were subject to recidivate. If you came from a, a poor family, you were subject to recidivate. If you came from um, poor education, you were subject to recidivate. None of those things existed for Michael Murray. Both of his parents were married. They were middle class. He was educated. He was. So what happened with him? Because he belied every single theory about why people go to prison and why they become criminals. It was the influence of his community that had a stronger bearing on who he was to become than his parents had, than his education could deal with. He was influenced by the, the people in the community that had money, that got it by high-risk means. <laughs> Read my dissertation and you'll find out more about it. <laughs> but the real issue was what made you stop? Was it church? Was it God? Was it what? I just got tired. Mm. 
and I could see a better way when I had the opportunity or took the opportunity to sit and think, where am I going from here? Another person that belonged to the Soils family, a very well known and large family in the Venice community. When I asked that person who didn't want to be in my dissertation, but answered my questions anyway, he said, you know, Naomi, I learned how to say no. When the fellows would come by the house and say, come on, let's go do this, he said, in the past, I would like get up and go. Why not? He said, but I learned to sit back and say, what am I going there for? The answer is no. And when I learned how to say no, I stopped getting into the kind of trouble that got me put in prison. There is no one reason, no one way, no one thing that was the tipping point for these individuals to come to that place in their head and in their heart to say, I'm not going back. It was different for every single one of them. But what was common in my conclusion was that it was the individual that came to the conclusion based on their own sense of values and where they wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And there were people who had been to prison six times. Six times. Mm -hmm and never got to that point within themselves to say, I had enough. Because their life was on such a cycle of rapidity of what they were into that they never stepped out of that box to look at themselves in their life and to make that decision. But when they did, it was a decision made. So I say to everybody, that I speak to, whether, because some people say, Naomi, why are you associating with that person? They have a criminal background. Why are you hanging around with that person? I, I don't hang around with many people. But um, sometimes, you know, there, there's that issue of guilt by association. You know, I, I, don't, um, I don't pass judgment on individuals for where they have been. I make decisions about individuals that I'm with about where they're going and what it is that they want to do. Everybody's a criminal at some point in time. Because if I made decisions about people and where they've been, I would isolate myself from my own family. <laughs> you know, so, so the issue here is what I said uh, in, in, in before, is that we have to make up our own mind about what our responsibility is, where we want to go, and if it's where we want to take our people, the people that have the consciousness and, and be assured that I'm not saying people that have the same color. I'm saying people who have the same consciousness of justice, equality, yes. social justice. We need to band together, work together, and the struggle becomes easier to bear when you can spread it around. From my viewpoint, I can live a certain life that is not reflective in the life of black people in general. But until, but until I can see that my brothers and my sisters and other people that are suffering, I don't get any satisfaction out of the fact that I don't have to deal with certain kinds of issues that may be in the lives and prominent in other people. Right. So, so you know, my my the, the fact that I can leave a certain legacy for my children does me no great pride if I can't see that same legacy for people in general. Yeah, you can set that example though. That's how you. And that's what I'm doing.